Good morning, everybody. We will get started. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. One day it's going to quit raining, I promise. What special announcement. All the deacons and elders will meet today at 4 o'clock here at the church. And after the second song today, we're going to have a video dealing with missionaries. The Eddie Armstrong offering 5,000 missionaries serving all over North America. And we want to make sure we uh, remember our envelopes are in your bulletins for our offerings for the, the missionaries. And we pray for, for all these people and uh, their families and give them our support. At this time, let us pray. Our Father, we just humble ourselves before you this morning as we enter your house. The things that you have created and allowed us to build using the abilities that you gave us. You just blessed all of us so well. Help us raise our families in the right way and help us to be the kind of Christians we should be. It's not easy. If we pray and let you empower us, then we can do it. And just help us to always give our best effort in the things that we do so that we can build your kingdom and other people can have the hope that we have. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Won't you stand and join us as we celebrate the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ through his sacrificial death on the cross. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood.
This is what the world looks like sometimes. Look at faces in a crowd and it's easier to see the crowd, not the faces. It's the way we are. But zoom in to one face, one person at a time. And if you look close enough, you might see what we see. The girl who gets high every day before school so she won't feel anything. Or the just immigrated Chinese mom who teaches her kids there's no God because that's all she's ever known. Where the world sees a crowd, we see a person close up. We're the ones who speak hope to them. We're the missionaries you send when you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We see what hope can do and we can't sit still because this hope, it's the hope of the gospel. It's a powerful thing. It pushes us to leave whatever is comfortable. It shows the lost, someone is looking for them. And it gives you and us a mission to complete together. In Puerto Rico and Portland and Montreal and Miami, in college towns and small towns and big cities, in every language, in every North American life, Jesus saves. We've seen it. And all he asks is that we, missionaries, churches, everyday believers, share what we have. Give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And this is what happens. New churches start. Those who are far off are brought near. And together, we send hope. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as, the, as he hath chosen us, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us into the adoption of children by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. I don't know about you, but sometimes I struggle with self-image and who I am, but this song is a great reminder that who we are has nothing to do with how we look or what we can do. But who we are has everything to do with who we are in Christ.
all blessings flow. And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! Try to see things my way. Please take your Bibles and turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. <clears throat> Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. Um, we're in the series called Happily Ever After. And if you're going to have a relationship that ends happily ever after, communication is a big part of it. Communication is a big part for your relationship, whether you're married or dating, ending happily ever after. Um, before we dive in, and I pray, I just want to let you know, if you've got any kids that are in fifth grade and under, you may want to send them to Children's Church because of the subject matter. So you've got your warning, and you can explain at your house however you want to explain after I get done preaching today. Um, Song of Solomon chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 is where we're going to start, but let me pray first. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, God, that I would decrease, God, that you would increase. God, I pray, God, that we would learn what your word has to say, God, in this series called Happily Ever After, and that marriages would restore and be strengthened. God, I pray today that we would be better communicators. Um, I pray, God, that my voice would make it through this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Song of Solomon chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 says, I compare you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are beautiful with jewelry, your neck with its necklace. We will make gold jewelry for you, accented with silver. Gentlemen, if you're not taking notes today, I want to encourage every man here, take notes. There will be benefits out of what I have to say for you, all right? You'll get something out of today's sermon, I promise, if you'll just listen to what I have to say. Communication is very, very, very important. And one of the weakest areas of many marriages happens to be communication. Many marriages struggle for the simple problem of communication. In verses 9 through 11, we see that Solomon is a pretty effective communicator. I'm going to give you several things that he does well. In verse number 9, Solomon communicates how he feels to the Shulamite woman. He communicates how he feels to the Shulamite woman. The Shulamite woman knows exactly where she stands with Solomon. Look at verse number nine. It says, I compare you my darling. She knew that she was Solomon's darling. She knew exactly where she stood in Solomon's eyes. Growing up, 
we had a neighbor that lived right next door to us. And um, he was a man's man. He, he shrimped for a living. But everybody in town knew how this man felt about his wife. He had an old pickup truck, or he bought it new, and it eventually become old. And so he decided to take some red... Um, uh, uh, spray paint and spray paint down the side of his truck on top of his truck I mean everywhere he could put it he spray painted I love my wife and then that wasn't enough he had a house and this house was on stilts and as you would walk up the, st uh, the steps there it said in red neon spray paint I love my wife his wife worked for my dad, and, and, and most men, we would write a note, not this guy. Nope. He, you open the desk drawer there to his wife's desk, and there, written in pencil, scribbled into the desk was, I love my wife. There is no telling where else in Barnum Town this man wrote that he loved his wife, but his wife knew exactly where she stood with him. He, she knew that he loved his wife. I just want to ask today, dear sir, do you communicate to your wife how you feel about her? If you're dating today, do you communicate to the person you're dating how you feel about them? Solomon here was communicating to his Shulamite woman how he felt about her. Look also, we see in verse 9, Solomon communicates compliments. Solomon communicates compliments. Not only as men should we communicate how we feel, we should also communicate compliments to our wives. He, he says there in verse 9, I, I compare you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Here, Solomon is trying to be Rico Suave, and he's giving a pickup line. Now, I'm going to encourage every man here not to go home and say, and look into your wife's eyes or the person you're dating and say, Honey, you look like a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. It will not work for you the way it worked for Solomon. Just don't do it. Here is Solomon, he's a young guy, he's in love, he's dating this gal, and here he is giving a cheesy pickup line. Well, the, the Today Show, they actually published an article titled, The Worst Pickup Lines Ever and Why Guys Use Them. I'm going to give you a couple of the pickup lines. Some of them are quite humorous. Um, the first one was, do you believe in love at first sight? If not, I'm going to walk around you a couple more times, all right? Um, there was this one, um, I forgot my phone number, can I have yours? Um, there was another one, I was trying to have a guy's night out and you totally ruined it because you're just so cute. Here's my favorite, can I have a picture of you so I can show Santa what I want for Christmas? I thought that was a pretty good one. Um, the guy extends his hand out and says, will you hold this while I go for a walk? Um, another one was... I had to come over and see if your personality was as amazing as your smile. And probably my second favorite is this, are you from Tennessee? Because you're the only 10 I see. Um, cheesy pickup lines. Men, don't use these at home. Don't go home and Google those and use them and think they're going to work, all right? I learned this past week that Pastor Rick Farrell here, he's over our children and youth, he is an expert in horses. I, on the, however, on the other hand, I am not an expert in horses. I know nothing about horses. The only time I've ever really had anything to do with horses was my mom's here this morning. They decided on one vacation that we were going to go to the mountains and we were going to ride a horse across the mountains. That horse could have rode that trail with me on its back or without me on its back. I don't know anything about horses other than what I read this past week. What I read this past week and what I learned this past week was that Pharaoh's horses were not just regular horses. They weren't the quarter horses we see around here. See, Pharaoh's horses, they were white Arabian horses. And it is said that a white Arabian horse is nothing like a quarter horse. It's nothing like most horses we see. It is said that the white Arabian horse, uh, when you put it next to any other horse, will stand out. That it's going to stick out, it, it, not in a bad way, it's going to stick out in a way like, man, I am just mesmerized of the beauty of this type of horse. So what Solomon is saying here to the Shulamite woman is this, you're so beautiful. 
You're the most beautifulest woman in the entire room. Your beauty catches my eye. Your beauty mesmerizes me. When I see you, I mean, you're just, you, you just, my, my head just explodes because you're so beautiful. Also, we see here, he says, you're a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. You stick out. And Pharaoh's chariots, they were only pulled by male horses. Pharaoh's chariots were only pulled by male horses. And so Solomon is saying here, every man wants you. But I, I am the one that got the most beautifulest woman in the entire uh, room, is what Solomon is saying. Ladies, I I need you to hear something. When your man has eyes for you, when your man falls in love with you, whether you're dating or married, he truly believes that you are the most beautifulest woman in the entire room. He believes that you are the most beautifulest woman on the face of the planet. You should amen that point right there, men. I mean, I mean, some of y'all need to pick up. Like, I'm trying to help y'all out. Like, I've just said, spoke for you, said, your woman is the most beautifulest woman. Y'all sitting there quiet. Amen, right? Amen. I mean, that you should amen that point. I mean, you feel that way about you. You didn't convince your wife. You may be in trouble, all right? But here, Solomon is saying, she is the most beautifulest woman. I caught her. He communicates compliments to her. Also, notice here in verse number 10, he communicates how beautiful she is. Now, last week in verse number 6, we talked about her insecurity. In verse 6, the Shulamite woman says, Do not stare at me because I am dark, for the sun has gazed on me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me take care of the vineyards. I have not taken care of my own vineyard. Last week, she said, Listen, my brothers, they hated me. I was out doing manual labor. I've got dirt on my face. My hair is all out of whack I, I i've just i've got a bad sunburn she's saying i am nothing more than a hot mess is what she was saying last week she is just saying i i'm not well put together now and she there in that verse she says i haven't taken care of myself i haven't taken care of my own vineyard but solomon here in verse number 10 speaks directly to her insecurity notice there your cheeks are beautiful with jewelry your neck with its necklace. He is saying that your neck and your cheeks, your, your, your face is beautiful. Now, notice here in this text that he does not describe anything he should not be describing at this point in the relationship. And notice he doesn't describe any other of the woman's feature other than her neck up. And that's done on purpose, I believe, because they're still dating. And so he's not describing features that he should not be describing at this point. He, he's only talking about things he should be talking about because Solomon here is a gentleman. Many women are insecure in the way they look. A, a lot of women have an area in, on them where they just feel insecure about. Men, we should be gentlemen. We would do ourselves well that when our wife walks in a room and she's got a new haircut, we compliment the haircut before she asks us, do you see anything different about me today? You should compliment her before she does that. Uh, Before your wife walks out and says, do I look big in this dress? You should say, honey, is that a new dress? That is the most, yeah, I'm telling you why. You're so beautiful in that dress. Men, you would do yourselves well to compliment your wives before they have to ask the question, do you see anything new? Do I look big in this dress? Solomon was addressing her insecurity directly. Also, men, you should be taking notes. Listen up. Solomon communicates not only the way he feels, he not only communicates to her about, um, he directly communicates her insecurity and about her beauty, he communicates compliments, but we see here also he communicates to her in her love language. Uh, Look at verse 11. We will make gold jewelry for you accented with silver. In our first year of marriage, I made it a point every day to tell my wife, I love you. Not when she was leaving the house, not when we were about to go to bed. I wanted to just do it at a random place in the day. And so every day I made it a point for the first year of our marriage to say, I love you. Well, at the end of our first year, I said, honey, do you know I love you? And she said, I'm not sure. 
And I'm like, what do you mean you're not sure? For every day, 365 days, I've made it at some point in the day to say I love you, and you're not sure I love you. I was not speaking Jenny's love language. I I was just not speaking her love language. Some of you guys are trying to communicate, and you're frustrated like I was frustrated. You're trying to communicate your love, but you're speaking the wrong language, and it's getting lost in translation. Some of you are speaking French, and your wife understands Chinese. And that's the problem of communication in your relationship. You're just speaking the wrong language, and I'm going to help you out. It will take about five minutes, and it will clear up any misunderstanding you have. It's worth every penny of it, all right? Worth every minute of it. Gary Chapman has a book called Love Languages. If you want to read the book, read the book. I encourage you. I hear it's a good book. If you don't want to read the book, they have a survey that you can go take. And it will tell you your love languages. We're actually even going to, we believe in it so much, we're going to add it to the Facebook link on our live feed. Just go home and click it. Women, if your wife does not, I mean, women, if your husband does not understand you, your love language, take the survey, and then at the end of the survey, it'll say, who do you want to send this to? You put in his email, and it sends it right to him, all right? Men, encourage your wife to take the survey if you're frustrated because you can't speak her love language. Take the survey. Jenny told me that. She says, here's the survey. Here are my results. I read the results. And I learned that my wife's love language was not words of affirmation. I was speaking the wrong language. Her love language is acts of service and gifts. So what I learned was this. I'd wasted a whole entire year saying I love you when all I had to do was take out the trash. All I had to do was go to the grocery store occasionally for her. All I had to do was clean the house into her that said, I love you. Two weeks ago, I'm losing brownie points. And by the way, I've learned my wife told me this. You should never point out when you do acts of affirmation like I'm doing something right now because it loses all your points. All right? I mean, just don't point it out. Just let them notice it on their own because if you point it out, you lose all gain you're trying to get out of it. Just speaking from personal experience here. All right. And so... um. Two weeks ago, here I go, I'm losing all my points. Two weeks ago, it was raining on a Friday. And I said, you know, i got to tell my wife I love her. So I called her up in the middle of the day and I said, you're at school, you got two kids, you're going to go to the grocery store this afternoon. I don't want one drop of rain to hit that precious head of yours. Send me the grocery list. And there I went to Walmart and spent an hour and a half of my time. Do you know how hard it is to find some of that stuff at Walmart? I'm just saying. I mean, testifying this morning. But I did that because I wanted to say to my wife, I love you. And if you ask my wife now, she'll say, yeah, I know. I know he loves me because I take out the trash. Sometimes I swing by food line. My kids even know where at food line the the, the flower section is. I buy these things that are going to die in two days. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's not a waste of money because to my wife, when I bring home flowers, it says I love you. So I bring home the flowers that are going to die in two days. All right? Do it. I'm telling you guys, learn your wife's love language and speak it often. For some of you, your relationship could heal and become dramatically better if you would just communicate in the right love language we see here in verses 12 and 14 if you're still with me and says while the king is on his couch my perfume releases its fragrance the one i love is a sachet of myrrh to me spending the night between my breasts the one i love is a cluster of henna blossoms to me in the vineyards of ingeti now now listen i told you if you would learn to communicate there are some rewards for you gentlemen today And so here I am going to give you the rewards for being a better communicator. Get this. Because Solomon was a good communicator, it led to a deeper relationship. We see this here in verse number 12. Solomon communicates to the Shulamite woman his love for her. He communicates compliments. He speaks her love language. He buys and has some jewelry made for her. And because of that, it leads the Shulamite woman to be deeper in love with him. It, It leads the Shulamite woman to be more attracted to him. Dr. Danny Aiken, president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, says of verses 12 through 14 that the Shulamite woman uh, was giving praise back to her men. Listen, men, the, the better you communicate, the more your wife, your girlfriend will respect you and be attracted to you. Do you hear that? The more that you communicate, the more your wife or your girlfriend will respect you and communicate to you. Ladies, uh, please hear me. 
hear me, ladies. I, I've avoided ladies as long as I possibly could. I have. We went through Ephesians, and, and ladies were like, we're next. And I'm like, no, I'm, I, Paul was a smart man. He didn't even address the ladies. I mean, he just skipped them, went right to for the workplace. I mean, but I need to address the ladies in the house, all right? So ladies, you, you need to listen up. Your man may not say this, but your man wants you to praise him. Your, your man wants you to give praises to him. Your man wants you to respect him and sing his praises. Some of you ladies, you think the way you get your way in the house is that you nag. You come up with a list of honey to-do list. You, you, you're going you're gonna to beat him into it. You're going to just keep on talking until finally he gives in. I'm telling you ladies a secret. If you will lift up your man and you'll praise your man, things will happen around that house you've been waiting for for years to take place. And all of a sudden he's like, she's praising me. What can I do next to get a little more praise in the house? There for a while, I'll be honest, I wouldn't let my wife go to a women's retreat. Why? Because every women's retreat she'd go to, they put some sappy lady up here telling some story about how she did not like her man and how her marriage was bad. I was like, I want to send you to a marriage retreat where they've got a woman up there praising her man because she's deeply in love with him. Amen, men? I'm glad some of y'all still awake. We, ladies, praise your man. Can I tell you something more, men want more than a praise? They want you to respect him. He just wants to be respected. Think about this. At work, he gets criticized. The world, if you look at media today, the world out there, they make men look like we are nothing more than idiots and babbling fools. Don't be the woman in the house that's going to add to it. Respect your Man, here's what I can tell you. Every Sunday I stand back there and every Sunday y'all walk out and you shake my hand and you say, Pastor, that was a good sermon. Pastor, uh, you did good today. Pastor, I needed steel toe shoes because you stepped all over them. And I appreciate that. But if my wife walks out and says that was subpar, it doesn't matter what any of the rest of y'all said. If y'all go out and say that was the most terrible sermon I've ever heard, my wife says that's the best one you've ever preached. That's all I care about. Women... Whether you know it or not, you have that type of control in your husband's life. Why not speak praises and lift them up? Encourage your man. Don't be the ball and chain that nags the husband. Don't be that woman because that is not a Christ-filled woman. Notice here, this couple, I love it. This couple is not tearing each other apart. She, she is not going to her girlfriends and saying, man, can you believe Solomon? He is nothing more than a deadbeat. Uh, and, and Solomon is not going to his buddies around the water cooler and say, guys, I can't go out tonight because I have that ball and chain at the house. You know, she ain't gonna... Notice that is nowhere through the book of the Song of Solomon. All you find in the book of Song of Solomon is him encouraging her and her encouraging him. They are complimenting each other. They're playing a game to see who can outdo who. Who can outcompliment who. In our marriages, we should be complimenting each other. We should be uplifting each other, encouraging one another, praising each other. We see here also, you can't avoid it. It's in the text. Because of Solomon's good communication, it leads to a deeper attraction. Look at verse 13. The one I love is a sachet of myrrh to me, spending the night between my breast. She says Solomon is like a sachet of myrrh to her. In Solomon's day, they would have this bag that would hang down between their breasts, the ladies would. And in this sachet, this bag, what it would be is it would be nothing more than fat. And in that fat, they would have myrrh. And as that fat would be warmed up to the lady's skin, that fat would dissolve and it would let off this aroma. It would, it would let off this aroma and it would smell really, really, really good. Good. And, and so one that she is saying here is that Solomon puts off this smell and it just puts me in the mood. Yes, this verse right here is very provocative. 
yes, this verse here is sexual. There's no other way around it. But I also want to point out that at this point, this relationship, this couple has not crossed any lines they should not have crossed. They have still kept both feet on the floor. However, she is sexually attracted to Solomon. And I would just say this, that while you're dating, if you're not sexually attracted to the person that you're thinking about marrying, you should not marry them. You should be sexually attracted before you get married. However, if the Holy Spirit lives within you, you should be able to say no to any sin that enters your life. Sexual attraction is not a bad thing. Please hear that from the pulpit. This is very provocative. It is very sexual, but they did not cross any lines. Matter of fact, she's going to teach a class in a couple weeks to her girlfriend. It's like, don't awaken love until it's time to awaken love. However, Dr. Danny Aiken in his book, God on Sex, says this. To get the maximum out of sex is to be married. The best sex is between two believers. Did you get that? To get the maximum out of sex is to be married. The best sex is between two believers. This shouldn't catch us off guard. God gave us this gift called sex. And you would think if you do it in the parameters that God has laid, you'll get the best sex. Matter of fact, I heard that your best sex comes in your 50s. And for this 30-year-old, that gives me something to look forward to. Amen? I mean, and if y'all are over 50, do not come up and tell me anything different, all right? <laughs> Just let me live in my world. (laughs) But it would make sense that if God says that marriage is between one man and one woman for life, and that is where sex is to take place, it would make sense that the best sex would take place in the marriage relationship. Uh, This is a biblical principle. So what is this woman doing if Solomon is not laying between her breasts? If you're worried like, Well, I thought you were going to go there. Give me a couple weeks that we're going to go there, all right? Just not today. We see here what is taking place is the Shulamite woman. She's crushing on Solomon. She's just sitting there, and and she's crushing on Solomon. She's attracted to Solomon. She, She wants to be with Solomon. She's laying there thinking, I cannot wait until I get to marry this guy. I mean, she is, she is physically, emotionally, she is attracted to Solomon. Which, which leads me to ask the question, dear sir, if you're married, dear ma'am, if you're married, let me ask you a personal question. Are you still sexually attracted to your mate? I bet that's a question you probably never have heard in the pulpit before. But I think it's a question that legitimately should be asked. Because that is part of the marriage relationship that God has established. Are you still sexually attracted to your mate? There is no question in verse 13, she is declaring that she is sexually attracted to Solomon. Get this, men. The better you communicate to your wives in their love language that they speak, the more they'll be sexually attracted to you. Some of you men, let's just be honest. What you say is, I want more sex. I want more sex. And maybe the reason you're not getting more sex is because you're not communicating in your wife's love language so that you can get more sex. Communicate well. If you communicate well, there are benefits that come from it. That happens to be one of them. Also, we see here that good communication leads to security and being more exclusive. Look at verse 14. The one I love. It doesn't say a plurality there. It says the one I love. She is talking exclusively about one individual. She is exclusively talking about Solomon. They are exclusive. She isn't dating. She doesn't have eyes for other people. Solomon has already told her that she is the only gal for him. I mean, they are exclusive. She only has eyes for him. She is saying here, Solomon is the only man that is for me. He is the only man that I am dating. And so we see here in verse 14 that the one I love is a cluster of henna blossoms. What is that? That is a white flower that would only be found in the middle of a desert in an oasis. So what she is saying here is this. In the middle of a desert, I found my security in this oasis. I see Solomon. He is this white blossom in the middle of this oasis because that that city there in Gete is, is, is an oasis in the desert. She is saying that Solomon is her security. When she is thirsting, when she is dry, when she is working, Solomon is the security that she is looking for. 
Solomon is the one that renourishes her in the middle when she is running dry. Let me ask, ladies, do you feel this way about your man? Or as I said in the first service, do you feel this way about your boo? Do you feel this way about the one that you're dating? Do you feel this way about the one that you're married? That they are the one that renourishes you. That they are the one that you can find security in. (laughs) Women, when you start dating, let's just be honest. Many of you go out on your first date, right? You're sitting there at that restaurant... And and you try to be all prim and proper, so what do you do? You order a salad. That salad comes to the table, and you take one bite of it, and you're like, hmm, I'm fool. You know you're lying to yourself and everybody else because your boy across the table can hear your stomach growling. I mean, but that's you. You're just like, I'm fool. And then you get married, and you become more secure with the person, and you go down to Outback, and you order the 12-ounce steak, and you inhale all of it. What she is saying here in this text is, I am secure in who I am when I'm around Solomon. I don't have to put up a front. I don't have to be somebody I'm not. I am secure with who I am around Solomon. Do you feel that way about your spouse? That you're secure in who you are around them? That you don't have to put on a front? That they renourish you? That they, they fulfill you? That they point you to Jesus Christ who ultimately fulfills you. That ultimately nourishes you. Dr. Tony Evans tells a story of a husband who communicated poorly to his wife and a husband who communicated well to his wife. There was this husband and he had a checklist. And every day he pulled out his checklist and he would say, She cooked. Check. She washed the clothes. Check. She cleaned the house, check. She took care of the kids, check. And at the end of the day, he would take this list to his wife and he would communicate, honey, you did well. You did 23 out of 25 things today. It is said that over time that this became to weigh on the lady. It became very burdensome for her to feel like she had to check this list off every day. Well... I'm not sure how the husband died, if the wife killed him or whatever. All I know is he eventually died. He died, and she says that when he died, she felt relieved because she no longer had to do this checklist every day. Well, two years later, she decided to head back into another marriage relationship. Except this guy didn't have a checklist. This guy communicated to her compliments. Oh, honey, you're so beautiful. Honey, is that a new hairdo? I didn't think you could look any more pretty than you did before. But with this new hairdo, I mean, you just knocking it out. Of, I mean, she, he complimented her. He communicated compliments. He communicated his feelings to her. Honey, I, I just, I love you. He communicated his feelings in, love, in her love language. So he took out the trash. He, he went to the grocery store. He, he bought gifts if that was her love language. He communicated the beauty that he saw in her, speaking to her insecurity. Well, one day, this lady was digging through an old desk drawer. Everybody's, every house has got one, right? A junk drawer. We just throw whatever in that junk drawer. She was going through the junk drawer, and all of a sudden she came up on that list from her first husband. She began reading down that list, and she realized something. She was doing everything on that list that the first husband demanded for her second husband and did not feel the weight of having and the pressure of having to do it. Do you know the only difference between the first husband and the second husband? The way they communicated to each other. Do you get that? She was willing to do everything for the second husband because of the way he communicated to her. Please hear me, men. Communication matters. How you communicate matters. As I finish today, I I just want you to, to point you to the ultimate communicator. The ultimate communicator is Jesus Christ. For you see, Jesus Christ communicated to each and every one of us how much he loved us. Jesus Christ communicated to us his love by leaving heaven and coming to earth, living a perfect life, going to a cross, dying on the cross, shedding his blood on the cross, dying in your place, dying in my place. He communicated his love to us on the cross. For John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ communicated to us his love. 
So how are we going to respond to his communication? Will we respond to his communication by giving a proper response by falling deeper in love with Jesus? Will we respond to his communication of love by having a deeper attraction, not a sexual attraction, but having a deeper attraction? In other words, I can't get enough of Jesus because of what he has done for me. I want to read my Bible more. I want to pray more. I want to worship more. I want to give more because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. His communication, does it lead to a deeper attraction? Does his communication lead to a security in who you are in him? Does it lead to you being more secure? Like, I don't have to worry about my imperfections. I don't have to worry about this or that because I am secure in who I am and in Jesus. I am made in the image of God. And I am secure in that. Does Jesus' communication of love lead to you having an exclusive relationship with him? It's not Jesus plus my little idol here and my little idol here and my little idol here. And by the way, an idol is anything that you put in the place of God. An idol can be your family. An idol can be a toy. An idol can be a car. An idol can be a person. An idol can be anything. It's not just a little statue. And so I'm just asking, does your relationship, because he communicated who he is and what he has done, does it lead you to have an exclusive relationship with him? Because, by the way, the Bible says that if you love anything more than him, you're lost. So do you have an exclusive relationship with Jesus? As I finish today, as we conclude and we head into a time of invitation, I just want to remind you, communication matters. And I just want to remind you that when Jesus Christ communicated to us his love for us, he didn't do it halfway, men. He went all out. When Jesus Christ communicated his love for us, it said, I'll leave heaven to come to earth. That's a big enough communication for me. But then he says, I'll die in your place. Jesus Christ communicated everything to us by showing us. Men, we would do better to communicate to our wives by not halfway doing it, but communicating with everything we have to our wives because we are to represent Christ in the home if we're a Christ follower. So communication does matter. Maybe you're here today and you're a man and you just need to own up and say, I'm sorry. Turn to your wife and just say, I'm sorry. I haven't been communicating well to you. Maybe you're a man today and the next step of action for you is to get on Facebook Live, click that link, fill out the form before your wife can ask you to fill out the form or send it to your wife and ask her to fill out the form before she says, I'm going to send it to you so you can speak her love language. For some of you, that does mean you're going by the grocery store today and picking up some flowers. Just to go home and say, I love you, because that's your wife's communication thing. For others of you today, maybe you're a wife here, and honestly, all you are is a nag. And what you need to do is you need to repent. You need to encourage your man. You need to uplift your man. You need to show them that they are the bomb in your book. And maybe that's how you need to respond. But I guarantee you, some of you, if you would just get the communication thing down right, it would fix a lot of problems you're facing in your marriage. So why don't we all say we're going to be better communicators as we leave today? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, before you can understand any of the rest of this, you've got to get this right. Your relationship with somebody else will never be right until this is right. And so let's work on Jesus first. I'm going to pray. Praise team's going to come up, and then I'm going to have you respond. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, God, that if we have anybody here, God, that is a man that is not communicating well to his wife, God, that you would just give him the wisdom and how he should communicate better. God, because he wants to represent you in the home. I pray, God, that if we have any women here, God, that are just nags, God, they just harass their husbands, God, that they would go home and they would try to be his champion, they would uplift him, they would encourage him, God, they would be a positive thing in his life. God, I pray, God, that we wouldn't cross any boundaries we're not supposed to cross, God, as this couple here did not cross those boundaries. God, I pray that if anybody here doesn't know you, they would give their life to you, God, I just pray that you would have your will and have your way. God, we thank you that you were the ultimate communicator and how you came from heaven to earth and died for our sins. God, thank you for all that you're doing here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please stand and sing? If you need to come down, there will be elders down front. They would love to talk to you. Um, Just let God move however the Holy Spirit needs to move.
I had a great day in God's house. Amen. I want to encourage you guys, be better communicators. Take that survey, speak your wife's love language, and you will reap benefits from it. Amen? Amen. Amen, men? All right. Just wanted to encourage you guys. You're going to learn to talk. Pastor Bob is our elder of the week. So, Pastor Bob, would you come finish this off? And um, if you have any concerns this week, please talk to Pastor Bob. And if you're a man or a lady in the church, you may have some work to do. So let's, uh, let's think about that this week, gentlemen. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the message we've just received out of your book, which we know is true and gives us rules that we should try to apply to our lives. And as Christian men, and we all want to be a man and be strong, but sometimes, you know, that's like we need to, We need to do what we need to do. And it may not be easy, but we need to work at it. And God, we just ask you to be with all the men and all the ladies in the church as we go through this week to to try to work on our marriages and all of us to do a better job because we never can do too much. And just be with us this week. Keep us safe and bring us back to this place again. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.